All right, thank you all so much for being here. Today I'm going to talk to you about why animal fats are good for you. Now that's not what we usually hear about animal fats, right? What do, what do we usually hear about animal fats? Yeah, they're going to kill you, right? And I think if we look back over how our diets have changed over the course of the 20th century, we'll find that there are a few driving factors that we could identify that have had such a profound influence over this transition uh, than this idea that animal fats are going to kill you. Because this idea that animal fats are bad for you has led us not only to abandon certain nutrient-dense animal foods that are important to human health, but it's also led us to embrace in their place food products that are rich not in nutrients, but are rich in refined flour, are rich in refined sugar, and vegetable oils. But before we get into all of that, I'd like to provide a foundation of what I would see as common sense, or what should be our common sense, about the role of animal fats in human nutrition. And in order to begin laying that foundation, I think we need to go back to the work of this particular man. Does anyone know who this is? Right, this, this is Weston Price. And Weston Price was the first research director for the American Dental Association, a position that he held for 25 years while he conducted animal experiments and clinical research and other laboratory work studying the causes of tooth decay and the role of tooth decay in human health. And after he uh, completed this position, he moved on to produce an epic work of nutrition, nutritional anthropology called Nutrition and Physical Degeneration. And in this work, he documented the consistent effects of the transition from traditional diets to modern refined foods in numerous groups on every inhabited continent, ex with the single exception of Asia, to which he was unable to travel until the second, uh, before the onset of the Second World War. And in every case, he documented that when groups were on their traditional diets, regardless of their genetics, regardless of their geography, regardless of whether they were hunter-gatherers or they were pastoralists relying on herding cattle, or they were agriculturalists, on their traditional diets, they had vibrant health. And he was especially interested in dental health, but he, his documentation went beyond dental health. So he documented very well that they had uh, very broad and well-developed facial structure, very wide dental palates that had room for all of their teeth, immunity to tooth decay. But he also documented that they had freedom from tuberculosis, regardless of their living conditions. And he documented with moderate evidence that they had freedom from cancer. And others after him also studied such groups on their traditional diets and showed that they were free of heart disease and other degenerative diseases that are very important to us today. While on the other hand, as modern foods came in, consistently there was this transition of not only diet, but of health, where there was loss of immunity to tooth decay. There was loss of this well-developed facial structure and perfect dental palate. And there was loss of immunity to tuberculosis, immunity to cancer, immunity to heart disease, and all of these other degenerative diseases. And if we look at the diets of all of these groups uh, who were healthy, who had their vibrant health on their traditional diets, we see a lot of variation. Not every group was eating the same thing. In fact, they were eating very different foods. And if we were to compile all of those foods onto one list, we could identify this list that I've shown on the screen as the primary foods that were uh, within the menu, within the spectrum of traditional diets. And that includes the large and small animals of the land and sea, the organs, bones, and the skin of animals, dairy products, including the butter fat, eggs, whole cereal grains, tubers, coconut, fruits, and vegetables. Despite this diversity of traditional diets, the modern di diets were all basically the same, and they were centered on what Price identified as the displacing foods of modern commerce. White flour, white sugar, white rice, syrups, jams, canned goods, and vegetable oils. And you can see from this list that with the sole exception of vegetable oils, most of these foods are very rich in carbohydrate. 
And Price was aware of this and he acknowledged this. And although he was not an advocate of carbohydrate restriction per se, he did say that we should reduce the carbo carbohydrate content of the diet to what he called the normal levels found in natural foods. Because he did acknowledge that as you uh, have this nutritional transition in general, you do get an increase in carbohydrate content. But carbohydrate content was not Price's particular concern. He was mostly interested in nutrient density. And he was especially interested in the fat-soluble vitamins. And this wasn't because he thought that fat-soluble vitamins were more important than water-soluble vitamins or minerals or any other nutrient. But it was because he realized that fat-soluble vitamins are not distributed very evenly in the food supply. And they can be very difficult to obtain because they're only found in certain foods. And he identified as a key characteristic of all of the successful groups he studied who were thriving on their native diets that those groups placed special emphasis on procuring foods that were rich in fat-soluble vitamins. And he divided these foods into four categories. Seafood, meaning the animal life of the sea, fish and shellfish. Organ meats and eggs. Dairy, including the butterfat. And the small animals and insects. And not every group ate all of these categories of foods, but they all ate at least one of these categories, and some of them ate two or more of these categories. So they all obtained fat-soluble nutrients from some source. And if we look at this list of foods, we can see that some of these foods are very rich quantity-wise in animal fat. For example, dairy. More specifically, the butter fat is where the fat-soluble vitamins are. Butter fat is an animal fat. Eggs are very rich in animal fat because they're a very fatty animal product. On the other hand, we have foods like shellfish or liver. Liver uh, is, both of these are very low in fat and very nutrient dense. So liver, for example, is a phenomenal source of fat soluble vitamins, but it's very low in total fat. However, that nutrition in the liver is found in this very small quantity of unusually and incredibly nutrient dense animal fat. So regardless of whether these foods are high in fat or low in fat, they owe their nutrient density to their content of animal fat. And why should this surprise us? Animal fats are the best sources of the fat-soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K, the best source of choline, the best sources of essential fatty acids. And it's not just their nutrient content itself, but the presence of fat in the diet increases the absorption of fat-soluble nutrients from other foods. To, so take, for example, this human study where volunteers were fed uh, apples fortified with vitamin E with a bagel, I know you don't like the bagel, but the bagel had either no fat added to it or low fat cream cheese or high fat cream cheese. And you can see plotted here the entry of vitamin E into the blood over time. And as time progresses, you see a peak in, uh, the, vit excuse me, in the vitamin E content of the blood. And you can see on the bottom is the, uh, the meal that had no added fat. In the middle is the meal with the low fat cream cheese and on the top is the meal with the high fat cream cheese. So the more fat you eat, the more fat soluble vitamins you absorb, even if those fat soluble vitamins are coming from other food. Even if they're coming from vegetables in your salad, the more fat that you have in the meal, the more fat soluble nutrients you absorb. So we can say a few things so far about animal fats. They were an important part of traditional diets associated with vibrant health, that's one thing. They were displaced during the modern nutritional transition by food products rich in refined flour, refined sugar, and vegetable oils. They are important sources of fat-soluble nutrients, and they increase the absorption of fat-soluble nutrients from other foods. So, so far, uh, would we say animal fats are looking pretty good or looking not, not so good? Yeah, they're looking pretty good, right? So you would think that they'd be saying that animal fats, at least in some contexts, are pretty good for you. But it, we said at the beginning that that's not what we hear, right? No. So what, what do we hear? Yeah, they're going to clog your arteries, right. This idea that animal fats are going to kill us came from this idea that animal fats cause heart disease. And this, emer this idea emerged in the 1950s as the diet heart hypothesis, which says that saturated fat in the diet, which is found especially in animal fats, but also in tropical oils like coconut oil, increases cholesterol levels in the blood, and that this causes heart disease. While polyunsaturated fats, which are found especially rich in vegetable oils, are, have the opposite effect. They lower blood cholesterol and then they prevent heart disease. 
Now, I think if the scientific establishment had taken the approach of Weston Price in trying to unravel the riddle of heart disease in order to generate hypotheses of the likely causes of heart disease, I really doubt they ever would have come up with this hypothesis in the first place. Because if we look at the diets of traditional populations who are free of heart disease, we find widely varying diets, but we find that many of them are very high in saturated fat and very low in polyunsaturated fat, which is abbreviated here on this screen as PUFA. And throughout this presentation, I'll be using the abbreviation PUFA to refer to polyunsaturated fatty acids, again, the fatty acids that are especially rich in vegetable oils. Now, if we look, for example, at these three diets, of Pacific Island groups who have been shown to be free of heart disease, we see that there's widely varying carbohydrate content, widely varying fat content, but there are some similarities because all of these diets are composed primarily of fish, coconut, starchy tubers, and fruit, but in varying proportions so that we get these varying intakes of fat, varying intakes of saturated fat. But if we look at them, we see that on the one extreme, we have the island of Tokelau, where the diet is over half uh, of the calories from fat. And since it's mostly coming from coconut, which is mostly saturated fat, about half the calories come from saturated fat. That's an incredible amount of saturated fat. And by contrast, only 2% of calories come from PUFAs, and these are coming mostly from the fish rather than from vegetable oils. We see the opposite extreme on Catava, shown at the bottom of this slide. And here we have a very low-fat diet, uh, almost 70% carbohydrate, almost 20% fat. But even on this extremely low-fat diet, the diet is actually really high in saturated fat. 17% of calories are coming from saturated fat, which is 50% more calories from saturated fat than Americans are eating today because most of that fat is saturated because it's coming from coconut. And only 2% of calories are coming from PUFAs in all of these groups, which is less than a third of the PUFAs that Americans are consuming today. And then on the island of Puka Puka in the upper left, we see an intermediate between all these. Now we could look at another group uh, the Maasai, a cattle herding tribe in Kenya and Tanzania, who have also been shown to be free of heart disease, but have a very different diet. This time the fat is coming from meat and dairy, so it's animal fat rather than coconut. But again, it's mostly saturated fat. And the Maasai diet is cyclical and largely dependent on rainfall. And you can see in this graph that the rainfall is plotted uh, during each month across the year. And you can see that it peaks in the spring and that there's a very dry season for five months during the summer and another dry season during, uh, for about two months, a more moderate dry season during the winter. And during the wet season, the diet can be almost all milk. And during this time, it can be about 40% of calories from saturated fat. During the dry seasons, they eat more plants and they eat more meat. Uh, but even still, because they're eating either meat or milk throughout the year, all around the diet is very high in animal fat. Uh, most of that fat is saturated, some monounsaturated from the meat, and it's always pretty low in polyunsaturated fatty acids. Now, none of this evidence proves that these diets prevent heart disease. It could be entirely possible that these groups are free of heart disease for entirely different reasons and their diet is neutral. It could even be that these diets do cause heart disease, but they are so protected from other lifestyle and environmental factors that they still don't have heart disease because of all those other reasons. Those could be possible. But you would think if we were to take this uh, big picture approach as a starting point to try to make a good guess about what does cause heart disease, the last idea we would come up with is that the very diet associated with freedom from heart disease in these groups, that is a diet high in saturated fat and low in PUFAs, would be the very diet that causes heart disease in our modern population. It just isn't the first idea you would think you would come up with. But when the scientific establishment uh, tried to solve this riddle. They didn't take this approach, and it was indeed the first idea they came up with. I'm sure many of you have seen these uh, two charts before. I'm sure at least many of you have heard of Ansel Keys. Can I get a show of hands who's heard of Ansel Keys? All right. Not, not a lot of people like Ansel Keys in this crowd. Uh, well, you can see on the left, Ansel Keys had plotted the fat uh, intake 
in the national diet uh, from six different countries along a line where he plotted it against the in, uh, incidence of coronary heart disease. And you can see that there was this very clean uh, relationship where the higher the fat content of the diet, the more heart disease. You can see on the right a little bit more honest graph with all of the data that was available at the time. Uh, the line is still there, the relationship is still there, but it's much less cleaner than he had suggested. It's the, the data is uh, bound around that line much less tightly than he had suggested. But the relationship is there. Uh, but the, the, the biggest point to take away here is not whether the relationship is there or not, but it's that correlation what? That correlation doesn't prove causation, right? So this is interesting, but it's interesting in, in the sense of curiosity more than anything else. Uh, there was another key piece of evidence to support the diet hy heart hypothesis in the 1950s, and this was that you could modulate someone's cholesterol levels by changing the type of fat in the diet. And this was shown in very tightly controlled laboratory experiments where, uh, with filled milkshakes, where they take the fat out of the milkshake and then they add in a fat of their own choosing. And they could add in uh, vegetable oils rich in PUFAs, like safflower oil or corn oil, and these would lower blood cholesterol level, or they could add in uh, animal fats or tropical oils like butter, lard, or coconut oil rich in saturated fats, and they, these would increase the blood cholesterol levels. And uh, if you follow the idea that blood cholesterol has a uh, statistical association with heart disease, you could say, ah, blood cholesterol is a surrogate marker for heart disease, so here we have a good foundation for the idea that animal fats cause heart disease and PUFAs protect against heart disease. In 1957, the American Heart Association was not buying this. They said, whoa, hold your horses, folks. You can't argue with a surrogate marker like this with these statistical associations. If you want to argue that animal fats cause heart disease, you need to do a, sh a study showing that if if you change the amount of animal fat in the diet, you can change a clinical endpoint like heart disease or stroke. These are the things that are interesting. These are the kinds of studies that we're going to do. In 1961, the American Heart Association totally changed its tune and it said for the first time that if you want to protect yourself from heart disease, if you're in a high risk group, you need to start taking out animal fats from your diet and replacing them with vegetable oils. Now what happened? Had the state of the evidence changed? No. Had those studies been done? No. What happened was a few people left the committee, a few people joined the committee, and one of those was, anyone want to take a guess? Ansel Keys. Ansel Keys, right. And so when the report came out in 1961, they took the same evidence and they said the opposite thing, and then they started advocating this restriction of animal fat in the diet. But the media didn't run with this, not right away. People just weren't totally convinced until 1984. Read some significant significance into the date if you'd like, but 1984 was when the results of the coronary primary prevention trial were published, and we could criticize this study if we had some time, but the real key takeaway point was that it did show that uh, people who were given the cholesterol-lowering drug cholesterimine had a lower incidence of heart disease than people who were given a placebo. This was argued to argue uh, basically what we were saying before. Now we have uh, really good evidence that lowering blood cholesterol levels will lower the risk of heart disease. Therefore, we can do that by taking the animal fats out of the diet. And this is exactly how Time Magazine uh, interpreted this. In 1984, they ran a cover article that said, uh, it was titled, Hold the Eggs in Butter, and they said that cholesterol is finally proved deadly and our diet may never be the same. They said, finally, after 23 years of recommending taking the animal fat out of the diet and adding the vegetable oils, the American Heart Association is finally having the evidence to back that up, and they've been right all along. But what was the problem with this interpretation? What was the coronary primary prevention trial testing? What was the treatment? A drug, right? Was there any eggs in the coronary primary prevention trial? Was there any butter? Was there any bacon? No, these foods weren't there. So this trial was not a trial of the diet heart hypothesis, and this interpretation was never valid. Nevertheless, moving on into our own uh, day in recent years, the American Heart Association is pushing this idea of replacing animal fats with 
high proof of vegetable oils with ever greater vigor. In 2009, they published a science advisory where they said that they support an omega-6 PUFA intake of at least 5 to 10 percent of energy in the context of other lifestyle and dietary recommendations. To reduce omega-6 PUFA intakes, they said, from their current levels would be more likely to increase than to decrease the risk for coronary heart disease. I would like to emphasize two words. They said at least 5% to 10% of energy. And they said this was only for omega-6 PUFAs. So you have your bottle of soybean oil, right? You have omega-6 PUFAs. What else do you have? Omega-3 PUFAs, right? So they're saying at least 5 to 10%. That could be 12, 13, 14% total PUFAs. Way above the 2% PUFAs that we saw in the trip, tropical island groups that were free of heart disease. Way more. But they said at least. And then they said, in fact, the data also suggests that higher intakes appear to be safe and may be even more beneficial as part of a low saturated fat, low cholesterol diet. So what they're saying is, hey folks, let's have a poofa party. Just <laughs> wash away your cardiovascular concerns in swigs of soybean oil. Let's have some fun, right? Let's push those poofa intakes as high as we can. 14%, 15%, we could see some drinking games here. We'd have a competition. This is the kind of poofa intakes that the American Heart Association is saying we should have. Well, we could, we could understand that they would say this in 1961 when they didn't have any evidence for it. At least when they had no evidence, it was excusable. Because we could say, OK, they want to make a best guess. They have to recommend something. So they can, they can recommend their best guess, right? It's just the best guess. But it's much less, this type of nonsense is much less excusable now that we have long-term, double-blind, uh, randomized clinical trials testing this idea and we can see that these trials miserably fail to support it and suggest if anything that at least this idea of replacing animal fats with vegetable oils is dangerous. So I'd like to take a look at these trials today and I have two criteria for including them. One is that they're a randomized controlled trial, meaning that the subjects were randomly assigned to either animal fat or vegetable oil. And that's because randomization is the key criterion for inferring cause and effect. And the other is that they're a single factor intervention, re replacing animal fat or saturated plant fats with high PUFA vegetable oils. And that's because if we change five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten things at once, we have no idea what thing or group of things is having the effect. Does that sound fair? All right. Well, that means that I'm going to exclude from this analysis several commonly cited but improperly controlled vegetable, tr uh, vegetable oil trials, of which, at least some of which the American Heart Association is very fond. These include the Ozo Diet Heart Study, because uh, the treatment in this study included increased fruits and vegetables and distribution of free cod liver oil, which of course is an animal fat. In, uh, I'm going to exclude the STARS trial because the treatment included increased fruits and vegetables and nutritional counseling. The Lion Diet Heart Study because it included bread, root vegetables, green vegetables, fruit, and fish. The DART-1 trial because it involved a decrease in total fat. And this is the one trial that I could justify including uh, despite the de decrease in total fat because you know I think this is the least confounding factor but it really wouldn't make a difference because this trial was fairly unsuccessful in getting the uh, patients to change their diets in the first place and in any case it was not successful in reducing the risk of heart disease so it wouldn't make a difference if I included it or not. And then finally the Finnish Mental Hospital study which is often cited as a randomized controlled trial but isn't one because in a randomized controlled trial you need to randomly allocate individual patients to at least two groups, then you need to have more than one person in the group. But the Finnish Mental Hospital study randomly allocated two hospitals to different diets and had one hospital in each group. So there's no way you could possibly call that randomization. And they put each hospital on a different diet and after a few years they switched it. So of course these two different hospitals are in totally different areas. They have totally different demographics, uh, all kinds of differences, including the fact that in the one arm of the trial where there was a reduced risk of heart disease, it was, was where there was uh, a very high administration in the other hospital of a particular antipsychotic medication that is cardiotoxic, meaning it causes heart disease. So you can see that there's a lot of confounding in this study and it can't possibly be included in this uh, type of analysis. So let's have some fun looking at the six trials that do qualify. In 1965, Rose and colleagues published the first ever vegetable oil substitution trial 
where they had a control group that ate the normal diet and two other groups that reduced the fat in their diet, mostly coming from animal fat, uh, dairy and meat and so on, and they were given a supplement of either olive oil or corn oil. And as you can see here, it just barely came to the borderline of statistical significance. The corn oil group had twice as many cardiac events as the control group and the olive oil group was in between. So the uh, investigators concluded that under the circumstances of this trial, corn oil cannot be recommended as a treatment of ischemic heart disease. It is most unlikely to be beneficial and it is possibly harmful. Does that sound like a fair conclusion? All right, well wait till you see the next study. In the Sydney Diet Heart Study, they did the same thing, but it was a much larger study. It was a longer study, and they did achieve statistical significance. And they had two diets uh, that were similar total fat content, but one was really high in PUFAs, the other was lower in PUFAs and higher in animal fats. And you can see the survival plotted over time here. The dotted line is the high PUFA diet. So you can see that there are uh, fewer people alive uh, during most of the course of the study, uh, and, and that remains by the end of the study. And overall, the uh, substitution of vegetable oils for animal fats increased mortality by about 40%. Now, if there were one thing in this study that you would say was bad, what would you say it was? The PUFAs, right? Because they're killing people? Is that fair? All right, well, you can see that the approach that these investigators used to interpret their own evidence was quite different from the last uh, group of investigators. And they concluded that men who have had myocardial infarction are not a good choice for testing the lipid hypothesis. So they, they didn't see a problem with the PUFAs, but they saw either a problem with their study design or with the men. These men aren't really working right. They should be living longer. All right, moving on to the St. Vincent's Hospital study. This is a pretty amusing scenario. If you like the last one, you should probably like this one. Uh, the original plan, the original intention, was to put 100 men on a 28% fat diet and compare peanut oils and coconut oils in one group to corn and safflower oils in the other group. Peanut and coconut oil are relatively high in saturated fat. Corn and safflower oil are relatively high in PUFA. So these are all plant fats, but this is the, the, the traditional fats versus the modern high PUFA vegetable oils. They were supposed to carry this study on for 10 years, but they published a preliminary analysis after five years. And you can see that there were five deaths in the high PUFA group, and there were four deaths in the peanut and coconut oil group. Not a very big difference. Very hard to say whether that's random chance or some real effect. But what would you want to know? This is five year mark. What do you want to know? What happened at 10 years, right? Yeah, well that's the one thing that we were never able to find out. At 10 years, I'll just let them explain in their own words what they did. They said the low ratio of the polyunsaturated to saturated fat in diet 2, meaning the peanut and coconut oils, was first intended to serve as the control for the study. I emphasize the words first intended. First intended to serve as the control for the study since this pattern closely approximated that of the usual American diet. Well, who wants to guess? At 10 years, was this the control? No. Subsequently, a control group, a new control group, was matched to the diet groups already under study. We are fully aware that by continuing to study the original diet groups, we made it impossible to have a randomized control series. Meaning, it is now impossible for them to infer cause and effect from their very well-designed, initially well-designed study. Despite continuation of the two dietary fat patterns, meaning despite the fact that they continued to eat these same diets for 10 years, the data from the two dietary groups were combined before comparison with the data from the control group. So they merged the two diet groups together and they compared them to a new control group that didn't get any advice at all that they pulled out of thin air. As it so happens, in this comparison, the groups that had originally been in the study had 17% lower mortality than this new control group uh, that they pulled out of thin air, and they concluded that being in their study was good for you. <laughs> unfortunately, unfortunately, we don't know anything beyond that. The Medical Research Council study found no effect of replacing uh, the ordinary diet, which was largely uh, based on animal fat with soybean oil. There was a possible confounder here where 
the diet, uh, the control diet, the subjects just ate what they would ordinarily have eaten. And in the soy oil diet, they were given a bunch of soybean oil and they were saying, they told them you have to use half of this unheated. So oftentimes they were drinking the soy oil and chasing it down with fruit juice, which doesn't sound very appetizing, but you know, it's, there's, it probably introduced other confounders like lower levels of heat damage and so on in this diet. So it's, it's not a very well controlled st uh, study, but regardless of the confounders, there was no effect anyway. I think we should pay special attention to two double-blind studies, the Minnesota Coronary Survey and the LA Veterans Administration Hospital Study. Uh, these are the two, only two double-blind studies replacing vegetable oils with, uh, an, uh, replacing animal fats with vegetable oils and not making any other changes. In both of these studies, they studied inpatients in their hospitals, so they were able to keep the diets completely controlled in every respect except the change in the type of fat. And they were able to monitor compliance either with barcoded tickets or color-coded tickets that uh, told them which dining hall to go to or which meal to get. They could collect the tickets, punch a hole, and then they knew who was eating what. So by, out of all of these studies, these two are by far the most well-controlled and the most informative. The Minnesota Coronary Survey had some strengths and limitations. Its strength was that it was very large. It had over 9,000 people in it. It was the only study to include women in it, and there were about half the patients were women. Uh, the limitation was that it was very short. Even though it was carried on for about four and a half years, people were constantly coming into the study and leaving, so that overall, all the people in the study were only on the diets for about one year's time, which isn't very long. And you can see from this graph that there was no difference between the high PUFA diet and the low PUFA diet in uh, the incidence of heart disease. But if we look at the survival curves, we can see something a little bit disturbing. On the left, you see the cardiovascular disease free survival, and you can see that these two lines basically mesh with one another. There's no difference corroborating the graph that we just looked at. But on the right, you see there's no statistically significant difference, but you can see that after about a year and a half, when there's a substantial number of people who have been on these diets for at least a year, the lines do begin to uh, emerge from one another. And you can see the, the dotted line on the top, which is the saturated fat diet, and the PUFA line on the bottom, which is the solid line. And you can see that these begin to diverge from one, an one another so that there seems to be better survival among the people eating the saturated fat diet. Now, this, the y-axis starts around 80 or 90 percent, so this makes it look like everyone's dying, but really only about 20 percent of the people are dying. Uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, so this difference is pretty small, but it makes us wonder what would have happened if these people were on this diet for two years, three years, four years, five years, six years, and so on. And we're never going to know that in this study, but we can get an inkling of what may have happened by looking at the results of the LA Veterans Administration Hospital study. And this was the other of the two double-blind studies, and it is the longest trial lasting over eight years, with most of the subjects being followed for over six years. This is very informative. It was also the only trial where the mean age was over 60. And what does that help us uh, look at? What disease can we see, get a better, better idea of there? Cancer, right? So this is especially interesting to study cancer. The design was they took 850 patients, randomly allocated them to one of two dining halls. In dining hall A, they uh, ate butter and other animal fats. Uh, they ate a small amount of hydrogenated vegetable oils as well. Dining hall B, they had one egg per day, uh, and they had a mix of different vegetable oils. If we take a superficial analysis of this study, it seems that uh, the vegetable oil diet reduced the risk of heart disease but increased the risk of other diseases. We're going to criticize that finding in a couple minutes, uh, but that, that is what appears to be the case at first glance. And if we look at the total survival curve, we can see that they basically line up with one another. There is a slight divergence that seems to favor the saturated fat group at the end of the study, uh, but it only goes on for about three months, and you, we really can't conclude anything without seeing a study go on for longer. But we'll come back to this, because there are some reasons to wonder about it. But we have to wonder, so what was this increase in non-cardiovascular mortality? Well, if we look at the cancer curve, we can see that for the first two years of the study, there was no difference in cancer. But after that, two to, in the two to five year range, we start to see 
the lines uh, diverge from one another, so that there's a higher incidence of cancer on the vegetable oil diet. And we see that after the six or seven year mark, this difference gets much larger. So that's very concerning because this is the only trial that tested vegetable oils in populations that were old enough to get cancer, and this provides some pretty strong evidence that they might cause cancer. But if we, cancer was only about half of the non-cardiovascular causes, and if we just look at the survival curves for all non-cardiovascular mortality, we see that the uh, difference begins to emerge after about four years. But it's really not until the seventh year that more t uh, survival in the vegetable oil group really starts dropping off a cliff. And this is really disconcerting because it suggests that we may not see the true effects of vegetable oils unless the study is more than seven years long, which does not describe many of these studies. Beyond that, it makes us wonder, well, if this rapid falling off a cliff of survival in the vegetable oil group didn't occur until seven years, is this little divergence in total mortality after the eight year mark something real? And what would have happened to total mortality if we carried it on for nine, 10, 11, 12 years? Uh, we don't know the answer to that, but the, but the last few graphs make us wonder and the, you know, it doesn't look very good for the vegetable oil group. Going back to the question of whether it's true that vegetable oil has decreased heart disease incidence in this study, it's very difficult to tease out the effect of animal fat and vegetable oil from some of the other confounders. Even though this was a randomized trial, because the trial uh, was fairly small with 850 people, it's, it was bound to not distribute some confounders evenly, and one of those confounders was smoking. And we can see from this graph here that there were twice as many heavy smokers in the animal fat group and 60% more moderate smokers, whereas there were more light smokers and non-smokers in the group consuming vegetable oils. Considering that uh, smoking causes heart disease and cancer, this makes this trial look even worse for the vegetable oil group. On top of that, the animal fat diet for some reason was deficient in vitamin E. We don't have good evidence from humans, but animal experiments suggest that we want 0.6 milligrams of vitamin E for every gram of PUFA in our diet. Vegetable oils are a lot higher than animal fats in vitamin E, but they're also a lot higher in PUFAs. So that means that we need more vitamin E when we consume lots of PUFAs. So we want to look at the ratio. And if we look at the ratio, the vegetable oil diet had a ratio that pretty closely approximates the ideal uh, ratio that we see from animal experiments. It was over 0.5, pretty close. The animal fat diet was less than 0.2, so it miserably failed to get anywhere near the ideal ratio. And we got to wonder why that is, because animal fats are not intrinsically low in vitamin E. For example, even commercial butter, the average butter that you buy in the store, has a ratio of 0.76. The average butter would have outperformed the vegetable oil in this diet. So they didn't tell us that much about the composition. Maybe it had too, much, too many hydrogenated oils. Maybe the animal fats were really, really low quality. Maybe, it was, maybe they cooked them too much. We don't know what it was. But for some reason, this diet was very deficient in vitamin E compared to what you would have gotten if you were using high quality animal fats. For example, if you were using grass-fed butter, you would have had a ratio of about 1.3, which is way more vitamin E than you would seem to need from the animal experiments. So, unfortunately, we have to conclude that the effects of animal fat, cigarette smoking, and vitamin E deficiency on heart disease mortality cannot be distinguished from one another. That long-term vegetable oil consumption may increase mortality from cancer and other causes. That animal fat may protect against the adverse effects of cigarette smoking and vitamin E deficiency. In other words, smoking and vitamin E deficiency should cause heart disease and cancer. So. Uh, Especially with the cancer, the animal fats seem to be really protective. And in the case of the heart disease, we just don't know, you know which of these was out competing each other. And then finally, studies with a duration of fewer than seven years are not long enough to determine the true effects of vegetable oils. And this did not escape the authors themselves. They said this small excess of non-atherosclerotic mortality in the late years of the study raises the very important and difficult question of whether future clinical trials of diets rich in unsaturated fat must be planned for periods in well in excess of eight years rather than for the five-year periods that have been the usual goal. How many of you see, have seen one study that was performed well in excess of eight years testing the effects of substituting vegetable oils for animal fats? I don't, I don't see any hands raised, including my own, because those studies, to my knowledge, do not exist. 
So we can conclude that there is no evidence from these trials that substituting vegetable oils for animal fats reduces heart disease risk or saves lives and may even do the opposite and that vegetable oils appear to promote cancer. There are several unanswered questions like what is the long-term effect of these oils? What are the effects uh, in healthy, free-living youth from the beginning of life? Uh, does it make a difference whether the vegetable oils are uh, balanced in omega-3 or not? How do they interact with other nutrients in the diet? What is the effect of high quality nutrient dense animal fats like good butter instead of the poor quality vitamin E deficient fats used in the last study? All of these questions are unanswered. Uh, I think uh, uh, for a brief amusing note, it's worth noting that the reason the LA Veterans Administration Hospital Study investigators used the high PUFA diet was not because they had a conviction that it was the ideal diet for preventing heart disease or that it, diet was the ideal way of preventing heart disease. Uh, and they noted that its composition did not correspond to any traditional diets that they could find anywhere because most traditional diets were either high in saturated fat or they were low in total fat. And they said that the expectation that this, uh, that this diet depressing serum cholesterol concentrations would have limited potential usefulness, uh, in other words, they wanted to use a low fat diet, but they confirmed that this would not be very effective for their study because in a pilot study a low fat diet was rejected with considerable resentment. So they... <laughs> They, they had to use uh, something that uh, would lower serum cholesterol and they tried to find some precedent for this type of diet but they said indeed only one such population, the Burmese, is known to us to approach this characteristic and of course they say approach meaning no one on earth ever consumed this high PUFA oil, vegetable oil diet which means that we're all guinea pigs. And they said, because total longevity was not affected favorably for this reason, and because of the unresolved question concerning toxicity, we consider our own trial with or without the support of other published data to have fallen short of providing a definitive and final answer concerning dietary prevention of heart disease. So we are guinea pigs for these oils that uh, have never been given good evidence that they will actually prevent heart disease, and they may be, as these investigators said themselves, uh, toxic. I think these trials have never been summed up better than they were summed up by the late endocrinologist Broda Barnes in his 1976 book Solve the Riddle of Heart Attacks in which he wrote, everyone should have the privilege of playing Russian roulette if it is desired, but it is only fair to have the warning that with the use of polyunsaturated fats the gun probably contains live ammunition. <laughs> So we can say that there are a few truths we can discern here, that clinical trials have miserably failed to demonstrate the harmful effects of saturated fat, that vegetable oils may promote heart disease and likely promote cancer, and if we go back to that foundation that we laid at the beginning for common sense about animal fats, the big picture scenario seems to indicate to us that animal fats can help us maximize our nutritional status, prevent physical degeneration, and promote vibrant health. Uh, that said, uh, many of you know that I'm not necessarily a proponent of consuming a particular amount of animal fat or a particular amount of carbohydrate. So instead of doing that, telling everyone you need to eat lots and lots of animal fat or you need to eat very little carbohydrate or you need to eat lots of protein, my goal here is simply to take the fear out of fat. We know that health promoting traditional diets vary very widely in fat and carbohydrate intake, that nutritional needs vary very widely between different people and may differ uh, over the co course of a lifespan within an individual person uh, depending on many different factors. And of course common sense would say that even though animal fats may promote health, uh, so do many other things, and it's entirely conceivable that someone might benefit their health by replacing some animal fat with something else because there might be something else in the diet that they need that they're not getting if all they're eating is animal fat. So rather than saying that there's a particular amount of animal fat that people should need, I would rather just uh, use a broad picture framework to uh, paint a uh, sort of lay out a menu of traditional fats and oils that appear to be consistent with good health and suggest that everyone take as much as they need uh, from these fats and oils and enjoy it while they're doing so. So thank you very much.